television interview for Angela Davis since she was acquitted of kidnapping, murder, and conspiracy in connection with the Marin County Courthouse shootout that took place two years ago. This will be a first-hand account from Angela of the events of the last 22 months and her plans for the future. Sister Davis, let me welcome you to Black Journal and let me speak for literally millions of people who are very pleased and happy with your safety. Tell me, the events that I guess you're now reading in the newspapers, do they corroborate uh, with the actual accounting that, of the events that you know best? Well, there's been a great deal of distortion in the vast majority of newspaper accounts, uh, television accounts, press in general. And uh, I think that the kind of publicity that the establishment press is willing to give me is simply based on the fact that they think that I'm good copy. In fact, that's uh, one of the reasons why I didn't rush to uh, answer all of the requests that have come in for TV interviews and radio interviews and newspaper interviews. I felt that, uh, however, that appearing on Black Journal was something that was extremely important because I know uh, that uh, you are interested in serving the needs and interests of black people. And therefore, I decided to do this one because I feel that this is a... Um, a chance for me to express my gratitude and appreciation to all of my sisters and brothers who've worked so hard and so long in the struggle to free me. Angela, in terms of the sisters and brothers who have worked for your freedom, could you put in context how the activities of those people actually ended up in your being vindicated of those charges? Well, there have been all kinds of activities over the last 22 months. But perhaps I can uh, give one very concrete example of the way in which the involvement of large masses of people, and particularly black people, uh, had a direct impact on the case itself. Uh, a couple of months ago, there was a decision from the California Supreme Court abolishing the death penalty. That meant at that time that we were able to make a motion for bail. There were felony defendants all over the state of California who also made motions for bail. But as it turned out, I was the only one who was immediately released. And I suppose you know that afterwards the Supreme Court modified its original decision mm -hmm. and stated that uh, um, cases that had been capital offenses that were capital offenses before the abolition of the death penalty would continue to remain unbailable. But right after the uh, decision came down, letters and telegrams and telephone calls and petitions and all kinds of things came in from all over the country and all over the world. And in fact, uh, during the bail, the presentation of the bail motion itself, the judge acknowledged the fact that he was receiving so many <laughs> telegrams and letters that he didn't have time to read them. Right. And I know that uh, that had an impact on the decision. What it meant was that the, uh, the, the judge could uh, release me on bail knowing that there existed a climate of public opinion which uh, would agree with that and he wouldn't feel isolated. So I think that that had a very important impact. And that had an important impact on the outcome of the trial. Because how would the jurors have felt if they saw me coming in from a holding cell underneath the courtroom, uh, flanked by guards and matrons? Uh, they would tend to look at me as already guilty, as already convicted. Now, that's what really happens to most black people oh, yeah, when they come yeah. in a courtroom. They are chained. Right. Uh, I've seen pictures of the, uh, some of the Soledad brothers as they were chained and led into the courtroom. Angela, um, how do you feel inside now, I mean, about being free? Do you have a mixed feeling about being a little bitter and a little sweet? Are you most sweet? I mean, how, how, how are you accepting this, one, the, this ordeal that you've been put through, and secondly, now your, your new freedom? Well, certainly uh, the months I spent in jail, the majority of which was spent in solitary confinement uh, weren't a very happy experience at all. But I wouldn't really say that I feel bitter about my own personal ordeal because I know that uh, so many of my sisters and brothers are right now 
suffering under conditions that are far worse than those that I had to put up while I was in prison. Um, my overall feeling about uh, the acquittal is that the victory around my case means that there can be more victories. And all of the people, all of the sisters and brothers who came together in an organized fashion in order to demand my freedom can see now that it's possible to free more political prisoners and to do something about the oppression which has uh, enslaved black people in this country for so long. Well, Angela, when you say political prisoner, what do you mean? Well, there are a number of ways in which I would describe what a political prisoner is. Of course, we all recognize that the United States does not recognize the existence of political prisoners. And in fact, uh, in general, when you talk about a person who is arrested um, for political reasons, you're talking about the use of criminal charges in order to uh, uh, stifle leadership, in order to isolate uh, leaders and, and activists from the community. There is that kind of political prisoner we know about. Bobby Seale and Erica Huggins and Huey Newton and Leotis Johnson and I could go on and on and on. The list is endless. The Soledad brothers. Uh, we know that uh, they were uh, arrested on criminal charges as an excuse for removing them from the community, removing them from their revolutionary uh, work and activity among the people. But over the last few years there has come into being another kind of political prisoner. And I'm talking about all of the sisters and brothers who are victims of the system, who are easy targets of the police, who get railroaded through the courts into prison, often for no reason at all, uh, who are there only because they're black. And I think uh, a brother during the Attica Rebellion sort of uh, expressed this whole thing when uh, he was asked by a reporter um, what he was charged with. And he said he was charged with being black. That's why he was there. And coupled with, coupled with um, the oppression that uh, leads black people and brown people, people of color, into the jails and prisons of this country, has been a new kind of political awareness that has spread all over the jails and prisons throughout the country. Uh, and George Jackson, and Fleeta Drumgo, and John Cluche, and Rochelle McGee, I could go on and on and on to name the uh, sisters and brothers who have achieved a political awareness and a political, political commitment behind the walls. But you see, once they do this, then they are subjected to all of the terror that the prison system has to offer. Mm -hmm. And so they end up spending years and years and years in prison under the worst of circumstances. Angela, tell me how I have been frequently asked this. We've received letters, fans of Angela Davis, and some brothers and sisters don't understand your concept of communism. They don't understand, they cannot, let's say, reconcile blackness and communism. What is your philosophy in that respect? Well, first of all, I think that black people, particularly black youth and brown youth, are beginning to see through the lies and distortions of the government and are beginning to uh, see that much of what has been said about communism in this country is simply not true. The reason I am a communist is because I feel that only through a total revolution which is going to overthrow the capitalist control of the economy, which will seize the wealth from all of the giant corporations that exploit and control the lives of all working people, but particularly black people. And see, I feel that the reason why racism is so blatant and is and has uh, 
been a part of the history of black people from the time we were first kidnapped from the shores of Africa is because it has helped those capitalists uh, gain more and more profit. And if you look at any factory, any plant, who does the worst jobs? Who gets, pays, who gets paid uh, uh, the uh, smallest salaries? It's black people. So racism serves as a, as a buttress, as an, a justification for super exploitation. And I feel that if we're going to talk about to the total liberation of black people, we first have to liberate ourselves from the material conditions of our oppression. And the material conditions of our oppression are no jobs, are bad jobs, unemployment, bad housing, bad medical care, and all of the kinds of things that will be eradicated under socialism. I think, however, that uh, um, there's been uh, a lot of confusion, even in the movement, even among uh, sisters and brothers who are fighting for liberation about what communism is all about. People have talked about uh, uh, black people being used by communists. Uh, and I think that that really underestimates our ability as black people to be leaders, and not only to lead ourselves, but to lead white people also. And as a, as a communist in this country, um, I see that the greatest revolutionary potential exists among black and brown people. And you let me ask the classic question. And so just, just one okay. more thing, and I'd like to make the point that when I talk about a, a communist revolution, I'm talking about a revolution which encompasses the majority, the vast majority of people in this country who are working people, but a revolution which is led by people of color, working people of color. Would you see this as, as a means of, one, eradicating racism as well as classism? The two are inextricably combined. You, uh, as I said before, racism in terms of its uh, uh, material base, means super exploitation economically. It means that, that, that uh, black people get the worst uh, of the entire lot economically. It also means that the capitalist, the boss, is able to divide um, black workers from white workers. Why? Because he tells, he tells the white worker that his problem is not those who control his lives, those who take his labor and turn it into profit for themselves. But his problem is, is uh, uh, the black man who's trying to get his job. And so racism is operated as a divisive force to prevent the emergence of a, of, of a real uh, revolution in this country. Well, the kind of thing that, you, that you're trying to do, Angela, do you see that as being in any way in conflict with black nationalism? Well. It depends on what you mean by black nationalism. Um, of course, I would never equate the oppression of black people in this country with the um, exploitation of white people. I think that uh, there is an essential difference. And there is a national aspect of our struggle as black people. And we have to maintain that uh, uh, cohesiveness and that unity among ourselves in order to be effective in, in a broader revolution. Uh, I would say also that for white people, for white workers, the most important thing they have to do now is combat racism. So that uh, racism and the fight against racism becomes the key to a, a, a broad revolution embracing all people in this country, all working people. Angela, when you say revolution, when you say overthrow of the government, number one, what do you mean by revolution? Do you mean an armed confrontation? Do you mean a change in the values of the system? Uh, when you say overthrow of the government, again, are you speaking in terms of a, a violent confrontation? Are you speaking in terms of political process? What is it that you have in mind when you... Well, I mean, that depends really on those who wield the power. Uh, if it were possible to have a peaceful revolution, and when I say revolution, I'm talking about a complete and total change in the entire fabric of this society, uh, a change in the distribution of wealth. We have to seize all of the wealth from the General Motors and from the Fords and from all of the giant corporations that control the destiny of this country today. 
but we also have to revamp uh, the uh, educational system. We have to revamp all of the political institutions. Now, if uh, those who are in power now would simply accept the demands of the revolution, then uh, there would be no necessity for violence. Uh, if, if there is uh, violence in the process of waging a revolution, that will be determined by the um, ruling class. That will be determined by those who hold the power. Now see, uh, let me just give you a, a small sort of a microcosmic example of what I mean. Um, Say a group of people get together and go out and, and uh, demonstrate in order to uh, uh, dramatize their demands around a particular issue. Um, you know, that's fine if they are able to do this in the way in which they want to. But what happens uh, in many cases, you have police forces unleashed on them because they are peacefully demonstrated. And my position is that we do not uh, uh, stand there and allow ourselves to be shot down and beaten. We have the right, we have the human right to defend ourselves and to defend our principles and defend what we want to do. And so I would say that uh, in the event of violence in a revolution, you always have to see that in the context of defending gains of the people. We have a right to defend those gains. Angela, now many people, black nationalist organizations, middle of the road organizations, black people, are talking about using the political process. Some blacks in the community have uh, now gotten behind McGovern, some behind Humphrey, uh, some behind Shirley Chisholm. Do you see politics as a viable force in our struggle? Do you plan to become involved in the political process of getting people elected to effect change? You mean the uh, electoral process? Yes because there are many different levels of political struggle. Well, I think that the electoral uh, process is something that should be utilized. It's not something that should be seen as the solution, because I don't think that uh, uh, simply by changing the faces and changing the figures in the government, there's going to be any kind of fundamental change. When we talk about a revolution, we're talking about a fundamental change in the system, a complete and total overthrowing and transformation of the system. Um, I feel that the electoral process is significant in the sense that it serves, as, it serves to measure the level of consciousness which uh, black people and people of color and white people as well have achieved. Take someone like Ron Dellums. The fact that Ron Dellums was elected uh, to Congress said something about the collective mood of the people in his area. And precisely because it said something about their collective mood, he cannot forget that he has a responsibility to make known the, the, the needs and the interests and, and, and uh, whatever his uh, contingency uh, uh, feels are the important issues of the day. Angela, to draw an analogy in another direction, the many people are saying that, many people, some institutions, particularly white press, that the fact that you've been vindicated of the charges proves that the system of justice will work for black people. The fact that you were found innocent by an all-white jury in only 13 hours of deliberation and only 13 weeks of a trial proves that the system can work. You know, I suppose they must feel that we are totally unsophisticated. Uh, at first, I really found it incredible that they could do this again. They did it after the acquittal of the, the New York uh, 21. They did it after Bobby and Erica, and now they're doing it again. But, see, it seems to me that the very fact that they're so quick to jump up and say, Here's another acquittal. It now demonstrates conclusively that there's nothing wrong with the American system of justice. 
if they weren't aware of all of the uh, uh, problems in, in the judicial system, of the way in which it has been historically used and continues to be used as a weapon of oppression against black people, they wouldn't be so defensive about the whole thing. Uh, how can you say that uh, this demonstrates that, the, that there is, is uh, justice in the American courts when uh, we know that the jails and prisons across the country are filled to the brim with black and brown people? We know uh, that uh, on death row right now, the vast majority of the uh, prisoners who are going to be executed are people of color. Um, we know that when a black person is picked up from the community and brought to jail, he's going to have to depend on a public defender because more than likely he won't be able to hire a good lawyer. And this public defender, what is he going to do? He's going to tell him to cop a plea, even though he knows in many cases that his client is, uh, is just as innocent as he is. Um, that uh, it just doesn't make any sense at all. And then just 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 one more thing, I am uh, convinced that if there had not been the kind of struggle that occurred around my case, that uh, I probably wouldn't be you know, out here now. In other words, if you had not been Angela Davis, well, not not Angela Davis, but well, I mean the, the well-known. The well, it's it's a, see this whole victory. It's not my victory. It's our victory. It's a victory of all those who struggled around me, not because I happen to be a special kind of a person, but because I uh, am also, like all of our sisters and brothers in the jails and prisons, a victim of the government's repression. And so what I'm going to try to do now is to build the very same kind of movement that was built around me and the kind of movement that, that uh, uh, liberated me from prison in order to free more of our brothers and sisters, because that's, that's the real significance of this victory. Speaking of your plans, and uh, our time is short and I'd like to get some, some uh, quick questions. Speaking of your plans, one, do you plan to go to Tanzania and teach at the university there? Well, I have uh, been told that uh, such an invitation is forthcoming, and uh, I am, of course, very <laughs> tempted to take it. I really haven't made any uh, uh, definite plans about that. However, I would say that uh, no matter how tempted I might feel as a as an individual to go uh, to another country where uh, you know life is uh, more beautiful in a country which doesn't have all of the uh, uh, oppression and, and and all of the misery that we see here, I feel a very special kind of responsibility to stay here and help to build a movement that's going to bring about some change for my people in this country. Speaking of other countries, it's also rumored in the, in the white press that you are now going to Bulgaria and to Russia for vacation. Well, there are all kinds of rumors. Uh, <laughs> it's true that I did receive an invitation to visit the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, I don't know where the uh, rumor that I was going to Bulgaria stem from. But as I said before, uh, I'm planning for the time being to remain in this country and help to do some of the work to build uh, the kind of movement that we're talking about. Of course, uh, in some time in the future, I probably will uh, spend some time abroad because I feel that I have to also express my appreciation and gratitude to all of the millions of people in Africa and in, in Europe and in the socialist countries, all of the... When I was in um, jail, in both in Marin County and Palo Alto, I'd get each day huge mail bags full of uh, letters from the socialist countries, and they waged a, uh, a, a really tremendous campaign. Cuba, uh, they had a committee there, and uh, did... Uh, I mean, they just went all out in my defense. And also, I feel that I... that. In expressing my gratitude to um, the people in countries abroad, I also have the responsibility to help uh, maintain the momentum of the movement that was uh, forged around me so that we can also uh, break some more chains and tear down some more walls.
words. <laughs> Angela, um, you're a philosophy professor, man, a philosopher. I think sometimes philosophers use terms that they assume that uh, lay people understand. One of the terms I think has become confusing is the statement that you were in love with George Jackson. Now, did you mean that? Well, how did you mean that? Well, of course, uh, as I love all my people, I also loved George Jackson. But then I had a special kind of uh, relationship with George as a result of, of um, you know, working on his defense on the outside and getting to know him as a person. And then once I was arrested, uh, uh, becoming closer to him because of the similarity of our conditions. Um, the prosecution's theory of the case, of course, was that uh, I was ruled by emotions, a passionate yeah. love for George. And my response to that was uh, uh, very simple. Um, and I think a lot of it had to do with the uh, uh, male supremacist notions and ideas. He <laughs> felt that, that uh, because I was a woman, he was going to be able to pull this off. I mean, it, I was just completely floored when I heard that because uh, what he was really saying was that to love someone is a crime. And that secondly, uh, following your theory to be a woman meant that if you did, you would be out of control by your emotions. Um, yeah, that I would have absolutely no ability to be uh, rational and to make decisions of my own. And was, Angela, uh, our time is short. I'd like to get a very important question in because I'm sure you'd like the public to know how you feel. What about your parents? your mother and your father during this last two years? Well, of course, the last two years have been a very difficult time for my parents, particularly because they live in the South and because of all of the pressures that they've had to withstand. But they've really been beautiful, extremely beautiful, because instead of uh, succumbing to all of these pressures, they became stronger. Mm -hmm. And my entire family was involved in the defense. Uh, my mother spent a great deal of time speaking across the country, as did my sister and my brother, who uh, is a football player and got a lot of pressures from that end. And uh, I think that uh, out of this, um, this whole ordeal, there has developed an even greater solidarity among us, uh, but it's a solidarity which has developed through struggle. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Angela, I have to say this uh, on behalf of our viewers, that uh, once again, you look well, and we're happy to have you out in minimum. And uh, we're very pleased that you're back with us. And as your plans unfold, uh, we want to be kept abreast of them. And I'd like to thank you so very much for being on Black Journal.